It's fairly common for designers to use CSS frameworks, or what we call them, a collection of styles that make it easier to build our designs. One of the most popular is called 960 Grid System. And what you see here is it sets a handful of classes that allow us to quickly develop uh, column structured layouts. So you see right here where we have one column and then we have another. So we have a set of three columns. If I were to right click on this and choose inspect element, you can see that it's being applied by adding classes. In this case, it's adding a class of grid four. So watch what happens if essence then becomes a class of grid 12. If I tab off it, that will now take up the entire width. And what's nice about this is when you're not having to measure on your own, you can create much more quickly. So if let's say we want essence and dimensions right here to both be on the same line. So we want two column lines. Well, grid 12 is the maximum. It's a 12 column grid. So why don't we change this to half of that, six, and then I'm gonna do the same thing with dimensions. And notice dimensions is showing up because grid four. So mostly we're trying to add up to 12, if that makes sense. Let's change it to six. And now six plus six is 12, and they're both on the same line. What if we want purpose to take up a smaller amount? Well, we could say six, and then this one would take up maybe four. That equals 10. So that means we have a grid two available to fill up that void. And now we've adjusted it like so. So yeah, using a grid can be really, really helpful. However, it's important to know some people don't like grids. They think it's better to use your own CSS or to create your own grid by hand. And a lot of people feel that adding these unsemantic classes to your markup is a bad idea. Remember, a class name or an ID should describe what your element is. But grid six, that says nothing. That's really visual. It doesn't describe anything about the content. So a lot of people don't like this. Now it's important to know though, there are a variety of ways to get out of this. There are what we call CSS preprocessors that allow us to create grids in our style sheets. However, that's gonna be a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial and it's still okay. Plenty of people will use grids like this. So let's get started. I'm gonna come back to the top and choose download. We're gonna open this up. As you can see, it was created by Nathan Smith. And it's gonna have a handful of folders in here, but don't let this scare you. What we really need here is within the code folder. And if we click on CSS, you can see there's a bunch of these here. What we need is either the 12 column or the 16 column. The only difference is the number of columns that it creates. If you need a lot more room, you might use 16 columns to fit more in, and each column will be a slightly narrower width. But we're gonna stick with 12. So we will copy this one, and we also want a reset, and we can also add text.css that will reapply some base stylings, such as making the font weight bold, setting some sizes for our headings, etc. So I'm gonna hit Command C or Control C to copy that. Next, I'll open up our working directory into our CSS folder and paste these in. So now we need to reference them within our page. So again, remember in the last lesson how I discussed HTTP requests. In a real world project, when you're ready to put this on the web, you will likely want to combine all of these into one single style sheet. But for now, you can keep them separated. So let's see what that gives us. Let's load it in the browser, and I don't have anything here, so let's make sure that we add a bit of markup. What we'll do is we'll add some traditional markup, and then I'm gonna show you how to implement the grid framework. So first, we're gonna have a div with a class of wrap. And within it, why don't we have our header and an H1 of my website. And once again, we'll do a nav with an unordered list, and we'll have three list items, each with an anchor tag that links to nowhere. Home, about, contact. And so our header is finished. Why don't we have our main section now? And we want to have our main content area and then a, perhaps a sidebar. So why don't we say div primary for primary content area. And within here, we'll have a P tag. And then we'll also set a sibling for a sidebar. And we're going to use the aside element because it's content that's related to the main content area or the primary content. And within here, we will say maybe an unordered list Maybe we have some additional sub navigation. So maybe six list items and we're gonna say sub. Okay, so this gives us some gibberish content to get started. I'm gonna come back now and reload and we wanna turn this into an actual website. So we are linking to those style sheets. If we wanna make sure we view source and click on them and you can make sure that you are referencing them appropriately. If you receive a 
error page, you know that you might have made a mistake linking to it. If we open up the 960 framework, these are all the classes that we can work with. So don't let these confuse you. Mostly, they're just different ways to specify widths and padding. Now, the first step here, as you can see container, it has a width of 960 and it sets the margin left and right to auto, which we know will center it on the page. And this is important. The 960 framework is specifically made for websites that have a width of 960. It's been decided that that is a good number to compensate for all of the various computer screen resolutions. Uh, that's beginning to change, so you might want to consider a width of maybe 1120. But this works too. 960 is extremely common. Let's come back, and now let's apply that class. Wrap, and then container. 12. Notice here that we can apply multiple classes by using a space. Now, of course, you cannot do that with IDs. You might be able to get away with it, but that's not what it's for. An ID should refer to one element, not to multiple. So let's keep it like so. And now if I load the page, refresh, you can see that that's now been centered on the page and it's been pushed over. If you were to apply a background color, you could really see this take shape. I'll do that right now for the example, background, red, and there you go, you see you have a nice centered website. The next step is to maybe push the navigation to the top right. So let's open up style.css and I'm gonna override container 12 and apply that background color of red because I think it's easier to see the dimensions of what we're working with. The next step is within the header, why don't we specify that the H1 should have a class and how can we set these? If we come back, look at all these different grids. Every grid is floated, and that's the way this is working. You create your columns by floating each section. And then it is overwritten where each grid, so grid one, two, three, all the way up to 12 has a different width. So if I were to set the H1 class and we gave it a class of grid four, we know that they need to add up to 12. So why don't we then make the navigation have a class of grid eight. Eight plus four equals 12, and this should take shape for us. And now, that takes up grid four, and this will take up all the available space. And now if I highlight these, you can see that. So let's go into style, and we're going to say nav li display inline, so that we can create a horizontal list. So that's fixed. Next, let's work on right here, main. So why don't we set a class of grid eight, and the aside will have a class of grid four. And now that's moved it over slightly, but if we apply background colors again, we can really see the effect. So let's do that now. A side background is green, and primary content will have a background of a grayish color. Now this might look really odd to you. First, this is the main content. That should be on the left. So why is the sidebar on the right? That should be over here, right? And that's because this is not clearing anything above it. Right here, notice how this is lining up with the top here. It's not quite clearing it, so it gets stuck right here. If we wanna fix that and clear it, we can either do it manually or 960 provides some classes. But also, we need to note that if we come back to our markup, because within our header, we have floated both the H1 and the nav, it has collapsed in on itself. We can verify this by going to style.css and setting a background color and seeing if that takes shape. Reload and notice it's nowhere to be found because it's collapsed. We can fix this by using the overflow hidden trick that we learned. And we could do it inline, overflow hidden, and notice that forces it to contain its floats. And you'll also notice that it fixes the issue that we have right here. So we can either manually specify this or we can apply a class of clear fix. Watch what happens if I do it right here with the header class of clear fix. And if I reload the page, that is going to work. And that's because the 960 framework provides a class of clear fix. And what that does is it gets the content after and it clears it. And this is what we call the clear fix hack. And it essentially forces the element to contain any floats. It's kind of a more error proof way of doing it rather than doing overflow hidden. Feel free to do whatever you like though. If we wanna give this some breathing room, why don't we come back to style and we'll say main margin top, maybe 30 pixels and that's gonna push it down ever so slightly. And also, why don't we apply some margin bottom as well? So I'm gonna use the shorthand, 30 pixels on the top and bottom, and zero on the right and left. However, again, that's not going to take shape because we have floated all of the elements within this main section, the exact same thing. So again, you can apply a class of clear fix, or 
if you use a CSS preprocessor, if you uh, increase your skills, you can do that without adding these extra classes. And that's generally what I do. And now you can see that is contained to those floats. So it makes sense that our heading and our navigation should probably follow the same format as what we have right here. So let's come back and adjust this. The heading section will have a grid eight and the nav will be grid four. And now if we wanna make sure that this lines up perfectly with this box, let's apply a background color again, just so we can see what we have going on. We're running out of nasty colors. And I'm gonna place this up here, reload. Notice that the lines are correct, but the list items aren't. And that's because a margin left for each list item is being applied. So you could say margin left is zero, and that's gonna push those over. And then you could apply margin right to add the spacing back in. So now we can get rid of that and our lines are nice and neat. Let's do a next section within our main content where we wanna have perhaps three or four columns within it. And within our primary section, we know it's set to grid eight is the width. So now we know we can have four sections with grid two. And notice I used the word section. Well, that makes sense to use a section element. And I'm gonna give it a class of grid two. And next within here, I'm gonna add a little more dummy text. Some editors have what we call lorem ipsum text built in by default. Reload that, and that's probably way too much. Why don't we seal it off right here? That looks good. And now I'm gonna duplicate this three times so that we add up to four grids. Now, if I reload it, it looks a little off. Well, how is that possible? Why is this one dropping to the bottom? And it's because there is margin right applied to each grid, and that's what creates the spacing right here. So what we have to do is specify that the very last one shouldn't have any margin right at all. If I inspect element and we are on this last section, if I set margin right to zero, and then we go to the very first one and we set margin left to zero, you'll see that that jumps up then. Now 960 provides helpful classes for this, which we call alpha and omega. And think you say alpha, omega, and sequence, so it works left to right. We can set alpha, and this will set the margin left to zero. And the very last one, omega, will set the margin right to zero on this one. And if I reload, now those are all contained. And this is really neat because you could then you have lots of sections right here. We could repeat this exact same thing. And now you quickly have a column structure and you didn't have to do this on your own. And of course you would probably wanna provide some padding within. So next, why don't we provide some headings? In Sublime Text, I can be clever because we have access to multiple cursors. So I'm gonna select this P, hit Control Command G on the Mac, and it's gonna select every instance of them. And then I'm gonna hit up and right here, we will add perhaps a heading four and we'll add some generic text. Multiple cursors are amazing. Definitely use an editor that supports them. If I reload, now we have headings for each one. Now, one thing that you will most likely do is you're gonna try to apply padding to each of these sections, and you're gonna find that it screws up your layout. So let's be generic here and provide 10 pixels of padding all around for each section. But watch, reload, now it's all messed up because padding is applied in addition to the width. So without any padding, the width is perfect for four columns, but as soon as you add padding, in this case, 10 pixels to the left and right, we've added 20 additional pixels of width to each column, or 80 pixels for all four sections. And this is something that, that irritates a lot of people. So you have a couple options here. One would be to add more unsemantic markup, and what some people would do is within the section, they would add a div right here. And what this allows you to do is then apply the padding to the nested div, and that's not going to create any issues. So what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna copy this right here so we have our newly formatted markup. And if I reload, it still looks the same, but now we will apply the padding to the div. And it looks like we forgot to add the final omega. So we have alpha, two, three, omega. And now that has fixed it and we're able to add as much padding as we want. Now the one problem with this though is again, maybe it's necessary to add that extra div, but be careful about adding too many divs. We call this div-itis. And if you're not careful, it can really quickly muddy up your markup. So another way that you can fix this, and I will remove all of those, so we are starting from scratch and I'll get rid of this, is to change the box sizing. So this is a very high level, but the basic box model says that you take the width 
and then you add margin, and then you add the paddings applied to the element, and that equals the full width of the element. However, older versions of Internet Explorer did it a different way, and some people think that this made more sense. Internet Explorer would take the width that you specify. So if I said this is 200 pixels, it would say, okay, the width of this element is 200 pixels. It can never increase. If we apply padding, we will reduce the width. So then the effective width would be 180 pixels, and then we would add 10 pixels on the left and right, which comes to 200. And a lot of people think, and I think even including myself, that this made more sense. If I set the width to 200, I don't want its effective width to be higher. I want it to be exactly 200 pixels, regardless of any padding that I have. So we can override this and specify that we want to use the older form by setting the box sizing element. Section box sizing. Now the default is content box, but we want to update that to set it to border box. So now with that applied, let's add padding of 15 pixels. And now we've added that without having to add any of these extra divs into our markup. If we switch to content box, which is the default and effectively the same as removing it, you'll see that we have that issue again. So what this does is it specifies that we are going to set a width which is already applied by the class that we gave it, grid2, and then any padding will be reduced from that width so that we never increase it and we don't screw up our grid. Now, one problem with this is it's a relatively new property, which means it may not work in older versions of IE, and you need to investigate that to see if that's a problem. Also, because these are new features, many browsers will add what we call prefixes while they're playing with them. So in this case, what you would wanna do is, now the reason why it worked just like this is because Chrome is an advanced browser and it's very quick to adopt the new standards. Browsers like Internet Explorer, though they are getting better, are not quite as quick. The same thing with Firefox and this also accommodates older forms. So though Chrome supports box sizing now, a handful of versions ago it didn't. In that case, in those browsers it supported the prefix sized version, WebKit box sizing. So this is a good practice to make sure that we are capturing adoption in as many browsers as possible. So that's all we're gonna do here for grids. I highly recommend you check it out. It can really increase how quickly you build a website. And it also keeps you from ripping your hair out when you cannot figure out why a particular block is maybe dropping down. These grids are highly tested and it will ensure that you spend less time fixing bugs and more time building your layouts. And the next lesson will be the beginning of our final project where we will convert a complete website over the course of a few videos to HTML and CSS. So stay tuned.